World War I began in 1914, after the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand, and lasted until 1918. During the conflict, Germany, Austria, Hungary, Bulgaria, and the Ottoman Empire, the Central Powers, fought against Great Britain, France, Russia, Italy, Romania, Japan, and the United States, the Allied Powers. Thanks to new military technologies and the horrors of trench warfare, World War I saw unprecedented levels of carnage and destruction by the time the war's war was over and the Allied powers claimed victory. More than 16 million people, soldiers and civilians alike, were dead. Hey, what's up, Jam? It's Gwim and Jamie, and welcome back to another episode of History Time. Uh, it's been a while since I've done this series. Last time I did the series was on the War of 1812. And we are going to take a large jump in history and go right to World War I. Um, so to start things off, like I read, this whole thing started with the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand and his... Um, Wife Sophie by a Serbian nationalist, Gavri Gav Gav Gavrilo Princip. I think I said that right. Um, they, him and other Serbian nationalists, were struggling to end the Austro-Hungarian rule over Bosnia and Herzegovina. Herzegovina. My bad. Um. Uh, so they, he, this man, say he assassinated uh, the Archduke, and this set off a rapidly escalating chain of events. Um, Austria, Hungary, and many other countries around the world blamed the Serbian government for the attack in hope that that they could use the incident as justification for settling the question of Serbian nationalism once and for all. Um. Now, when before before this World War One started, um, Russia is it, a thing to know that Russia was a huge supporter of Serbia, um, and because of that, Austria-Hungary waited to declare war until its leaders received assurance from a German leader, um, from the from the German leader at the time, Kaiser Wilhelm II, uh, that Germany would support them. Because, obviously, a country like Austria-Hungary would not be able to go up against a mighty military like Russia by themselves. Um, they, they also feared that if they, that, that if they did that and the Russians intervened, it would involve their ally France and possibly Britain, which were... Still at the time, two of the greatest militaries in the world. Okay, I'm not going to say the greatest militaries in the world because France, there, that kind of reputation dropped off a bit, like a lot. Um, and but the British, mil the British Empire, and the British military, they were still a thing to be reckoned with. And I believe at the time they still had one of the most power. Well, yeah, they had one of the most powerful navies at the time. I don't think it was the most powerful, but they did have one of the most powerful navies at the time of World War One, and that was not something that Europe could generally compete with, um, or at least the country, most of the countries that were in World War One couldn't compete with, uh, and then with the British Navy alone, just because they weren't in the, their countries weren't in a position to have a navy. Most of them were in the middle of Europe. Uh, the only bodies of water really were channels that merchant ships went out and whatnot. That's not to say they didn't have a navy, because uh, Germany did have a navy. Um, I can't remember who else all had navies, but they couldn't have massive navies to combat uh, these types of uh, the, uh, these massive navies because that have bodies of water around them to have large navies. So uh, they didn't want to compete with that. They also didn't want to compete with the military, the with the mil with the, yeah with the military of a lot of these bigger, more well-developed countries. Um, 
But yeah, they didn't. Austria-Hungary did not want to declare war on Serbia until uh, they knew that they had a lar- a strong military at their back, which Germany did have a really strong military at the time as well. Um. But after all that, World War One did begin, and uh, the Austrian Hungary, Austria Hungary was re- they were they were ready for war. They believed that they could take on the world. Now that they have German, now that they have German back, um, that, well, that they have a German backing, they can take on the world basically, um, which they they tried to do, um, and Germany tried to do that later on in life but that's a different video um so the serbian government ordered the serbian army to mobilize and appeal to russia for assistance and on july 28th austria hungary finally declared war with serbia and the tenacious peace between europe's great powers quickly collapsed um and by collapsed i mean that within a week Russia, Belgium, France, Great Britain, and Serbia lined up against Austria-Hungary and Germany, which started World War I. Now, a lot of people don't know this, but the United States was not part of World War I for a while. Like, they tried to stay out of World War I because they didn't believe what happened over in Europe meant was necessarily the problems of Western civilization. Um, or at least them in North America, they didn't, they, the, they didn't believe they, like, well, basically, yeah, Western civilization, basically, because it was very hard to get Western powers there. Mo- just for the most of the war, it was basically, um, all Eastern powers. Um, so this, the, the, uh, the Western front. Which basically is France, Britain, all of them. Um, Germany launched an aggressive military strategy known as the Schleifen Plan. Yeah, the Schleifen Plan. Um, it was basically Germany. Germany began fighting World War One on two fronts, invading France through neutral Belgium in the west and confronting Russia on the east. So right now. Germany's just already spreading themselves. You can see uh, where this is going to lead because Germany's already spreading themselves to fight on two fronts. Um, they it, on August fourteenth, they cr- German troops crossed the border into Belgium, um, where that which led to the first battle of World War One, where the Germans assaulted the heavily fortified city of Liege. Using the most powerful weapons in their arsenal, enormous siege cannons to capture the city by August 15th, leaving death and destruction in their wake, including the shooting of civilians and the execution of a Belgian priest whom they accused of inciting civil resistance. The Germans advanced through Belgium towards France after that. Um, now, this is something to note because Belgium was, out, like, like I said, a neutral country until this happened. August 4th to August 15th. That's literally like that's 2 weeks. So this this goes to show how tough the German army was. Um but we also have to put into perspective that Belgium wasn't ready for a fight um or at least wasn't ready for a massive fight. Uh, they were new, supposed to be neutral, but Germany was just like, nah, fuck you guys. We're just gonna go into you, basically. <laughs> um, but after the remainder of the France, they led to the first battle of the Marine, of the Marne, not the Marine, the Marne, um, which was fought from September, which was fought from September 6th to the 9th in 1914, uh, where French and British forces confronted the invading German army which had then perpetrated deep into northeastern France within 30 miles of Paris. Um, and this was all, most of the stuff that happened was significant because these guys basically went through France like it was no problem. Um, the, uh, the Allied troops checked German advances and mounted a very successful counterattack. 
uh, which managed to drive the Germans back north of the Eisen River. Ice, Asni River. I think that's how you say it. I don't know. I don't speak whatever language that is. Um, they, this meant that the Germans' plans for a quick victory in France was gone. They, um, they expected to just kind of plow through France completely, but obviously they couldn't do that. I mean, they managed to get through France with relative ease, um, but the French army backed by the British, the French military backed by the British military, uh, was just too much for the German army to handle in France. Therefore, they uh, they couldn't make it through with – they can go through with their plan completely. Um, both sides after that had dug trenches and this was starting – this was the start of a hellish – and I mean hellish – war of attrition, which lasted for more than three years. Um, and basically what that means is that this was basically a test to see who could last the longest, which side would give up first, which side had, was able to push more through the other side, which side was stronger, which side was weak. Um, and this lasted for three years. So it goes to show you that neither sides were really going to give up. Um... Some of the longest and most costly battles in this campaign were fought at Verdun. Obviously, we've all heard of the battles of Verdun and whatnot. Very, very bad thing. It lasted from February to December of 1916. And so it lasted the entire year, basically. And the Battle of Somme from July to November of 1916. So half the year, just about. Um, both sides, German and French, combined, uh, was close to a mil million casualties in the Battle of Verdun alone. That's combined, so put in the amount of, uh, I don't know the exact numbers, but put in the amount of deaths at the Battle of Somme, and that's gonna be a very, that's a lot of deaths right there for you. So, what was it, 16, 19 million? Um... Yeah, 16 million, it's kind of, uh, kind of something that is to be believed. Um, this, it was just, like I said, it was just a hellish, it was, just, it was hell on the Western Front. Um, many people died, many people lived with the horror of that, um, but this was also something to note where Germany it, – it's one of those things where Germany was so confident that they could just plow through French – through French – through France, but they weren't able to. You know, they were pushed back really hard by the French army and the, fr the French military with the British backing. Which is one of the, which is why Austria Hungary didn't want to go into this alone because this if the, if they went into it alone there would be no way that Austria Hungary would survive. <laughs> uh, then we go to the Eastern Front, where we had the Russian where Russian forces invaded the German held regions of East Prussia and Poland, uh, but they were then stopped not too soon not too short not too long. After that, by German and Austrian forces at the Battle of Tannenberg in August 1914. Um, even though Germany won that fight, Russia's assault had forced Germany to move two corps from the Western Union to the Eastern, uh, contributing to the Germans' loss in the Battle of the Marne. Um, and this is because Russia, they basically, it was. <sighs> Russia literally has an infinite amount of people to send out to battle. Um, there's, uh, it, and it's historically, it's a historic, hor historically accurate meme, um, well, historically accurate memes where 
uh, Germany in World War One and Two, where Germany would push into Russia and start fighting Russia, but they couldn't beat them because not only did they, like not even outside of Russia, not even inside Russia, outside of Russia, they were having trouble beating them because Russia would just constantly send waves and waves and numerous amounts of men and men to fight these battles uh how they, they even got to the point in world war ii maybe in world war one i'm not too sure about that um where they they had so many people they couldn't produce enough weapons they literally sent soldiers out into the battlefield with no weapons and they just had to hopefully find a weapon um and if they couldn't find one quick enough then they just had to hope to not get shot and hope that somebody else hope that they could find a weapon um so I mean that was a big contributor to both world wars the massive amount, the massive Russian military. Um but and uh combined with the fierce resist resi the fierce allied resistance of Fr in France uh the ability of Russia's huge war machine to mobilize relatively quickly in the east ensured a longer more grueling conflict instead of a quick victory instead of the quick victory Germany had in plan. Um, so basically Germany's whole plan was to go into, it was to go into this war and basically just demolish everybody. They had this idea that no one could beat their armed military. So they had this plan where they were just going to fight on two fronts easily and push through, get, kill everybody easily, you know, um, they, they, I mean, uh, their whole plan was they would fight on these two fronts. Uh, they would, they planned on having the French, uh, having the Western Front, um, in France be taken, be dealt with a lot sooner than they, than they hoped. Uh, well, a lot sooner than, uh, they, than actually, than what actually happened. Um, and then they could send all of their, all of the military from that was one on that side all the way over to the Eastern Front to help fight Russia. Um, but as we uh, previously went over, that didn't happen. The French and British uh, managed to hold Germany back there. Um, and that allowed Russia's massive military, I can't stress enough how massive their military was, um, and it allowed them to mobilize quick enough to be able to launch a good enough, a uh, good enough offensive, to give Germany hell, enough hell to force them to bring two corps um, over to the Eastern Front. Um, but that that then we lead to then this leads to the Russian Revolution from 1914 to 1916, which was obviously World War One. Um, they, they, even though they mounted several offensives in World War I, uh, on the Eastern Front, they weren't able to break through Germany's lines. Um, so their defeat on the battlefield combined with economic instability and scarcity of food and other essentials led to the mounting discontent among the bulk of Russia's population, especially the poverty-stricken workers and peasants, uh, which increased the hostility directed towards the imperial regime of Tsar Nicholas II and his unpopular German-born wife, Alexandra. Um, this basically exploded into the Russian Revolution of 1917, headed by uh, Vladimir Lenin and the Bolsheviks. Um... This was not good for Russia. Um, now, I, I did, it didn't. The revolution didn't actually start until after the war. Um, but uh, they, or well, no, it did start during the war, just close to the end of it. Uh, literally, the last year of the war, basically. Um, and it wasn't good for Russia. Not only were they fighting. Um, there now were only were they fighting the Germans, but now they had to uh, fight off their own people. So, 
Uh, Russia wasn't looking too good, but they were looking good enough to keep Germany, you know, out of them. And now we enter the now now we get into the part where America enters the war. Um, and uh, this uh. The, the United States basically remained, like I said, remained out of it um, for most of it. Uh, this is mainly due to, adop to the, pol the adoption of the policy of neutrality favored by President Woodrow Wilson. Um, they, this allowed them to stay out of the conflict while also still engaging in commerce and shipping within both sides of the con of the European uh, nations that were in this war. Um, the neutrality that they had, though, it became increasingly more difficult to maintain um, in the fence of Germany's unheckled submarine aggression against the neutral ships, including those carrying passengers. Um... And in 1915, Germany declared the waters around the British Isles to be a war zone, and German U-boats so that led to German U-boats sinking several commercial and passenger vessel vessels, including some U.S. ships. Um, there was widespread po protest over a the sinking by U-boat of a British ocean liner of the British ocean liner uh, Lusitan Lusitania. Traveling from New York to Liverpool, um, uh, this had hundreds of American passengers on board, and, and so in May of 1915, in May of 1915, which helped turn the tide of American public opinion against Germany. Uh, so this was basically the tipping point. This is the straw that broke the camel's back. You know, Germany kept prying and pushing. They were being reckless uh, with by attacking neutral ships. Um, and by, by neutral, I mean countries who weren't part of the war, who didn't want to be part of the war, such as the United States. Um, these countries did not want to be part of the war, but Germany sunk them anyways because they were in these waters that they declared a war zone. Um, and this led to February of 1917, where Congress passed a $250 million, $250 million arms appropriation bill intended to make the United States ready for war. Uh, following that, Germany sunk two more U.S. merchant ships following the month, and on April 2nd, Woodrow Wilson appeared before Congress and called for a declaration of war against Germany. Hence, the United States is now in the World War I. <laughs> um... This leads to the Gapoli campaign. Um, at this point, World War One has effectively gone into a stalemate. Um, the Allies have attempted to score a victory against the Ottoman Empire, which entered the conflict on the side of the Central Powers in late 1914. So the Ottoman Empire is part of became part of this now. Um, after the failed attack on Dardanelles. Uh, Allied forces led by Britain launched an, a large-scale land invasion of uh, Gallip Gallipoli, 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 um, Gallipoli of the Gallipoli Peninsula in April of 2015. Wow, I'm, I apologize. I'm, it's late. Um, this invasion was a dismal failure. Um, in January of 1916, allies, allied forces were staged a full retreat from the shore of the peninsula after suffering 250,000 casualties. Uh, British-led forces also com combated the Ottoman Turks in Egypt and uh, Mesopotamia. While in northern Italy, Austrian and Italian troops faced off in a series of 12 battles along the Isonoso River, located at the border between the two nations. Um, so, these new countries are entering the war um, for the Central Powers. Uh, obviously, the 
allies couldn't get to the couldn't get through the Ottoman Empire. The Ottoman Empire basically whipped their asses, um, causing them to get the fuck out of there um, for the time being, at least. So um, it's uh, it was not a good time in World War One for the Allied powers then. Um, now we get into the Battle of Eisenozo, uh, where the first battle took place the late spring of 1915. Uh, this happened soon after Italy's entrance uh, into the war on the Allied side. <laughs> now, Italy, <sighs> Italy was fucking bipolar in both world wars, man. Like in World War One, they originally entered on the side of the Allies. But then they moved quickly over to the side of the Axis at the end of the war, uh, which basically it wasn't good for them. Let's put it that way. Um, and then in World War Two, where Italy was completely outmatched, they switched over to the Allied side later after. So you know, Italy has had a history of uh, being that kid in school who's just like. Who plays basketball? We play basketball in the gym, and you're on the losing team, and you're like, "Hey, you want to switch teams with me?" Or they're, or you know, more like, "I'm gonna be on their team now because they're winning." Um, but this was, um, like I said, this happened shortly after Italy's entrance into the war, uh, in the twelfth battle of the of the. Eisenozo, also known as the Battle of Caporetto, um, in October of 1917, German reinforcements help, German reinforcements help Austria-Hungary win a decisive victory. Um, after that, after this battle, uh, the Allies of Italy jumped in to offer increased assistance. British and French and later American troops arrived in the region, and the Allies began to take back the Italian front. Um, now, this next part is a, it's an interesting one, uh, cause we can, we're now getting into World War One at sea. Um, so obviously, like I said before, uh, Britain's Royal Navy was unchallenged, basically. They were, they, they were the Navy of all navies at the time. Uh, no one could go against them. Um, but Germany's navy did manage to make quite big strides in the uh, naval game. Obviously with the invention of the U-boat and then their submarines and whatnot. Um, so I mean, I, I, earlier I said that Germany couldn't know that no other country could keep up with Britain's navy. Um... Germany, even though they made these substantial strides, they uh, they couldn't really they they weren't they weren't gonna win. Um, they did manage to close the gap enough, however, to have a really strong, pre very good and strong presence in um, in in the seas in the naval combat uh, in the naval combat. In naval combat, um, because of its, it, 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 most of their boats were aided by its lethal fleet. Like, when I mean lethal, they were fucking deadly um, of U-boat submarines. Um, after the Battle of Dogger Bank in January 1915, which the British mounted a surprise attack on German ships in North Sea, the German Navy chose not to confront Brit Britain's mighty Royal Navy in a major battle for more than a year preferring to rest the bulk of its naval strategy on its U-boats. So, like I said, they didn't stand a chance against the Royal Navy. Uh, they may have made these great, massive strides against in their Navy, but they weren't going to stand a chance against this na against the uh, British Navy. Because, I mean, what are you going to do? The, the Britain is literally on an island by its... Not by itself, obviously. You've got, like, several other countries there. But... Britain's on an island, so you're going to need a strong, and I mean strong, naval presence to keep people away 
from your island, from your home. Um, now we're getting into the Second Battle of the Marne, where Germany manages to build up its strength in the western uh, on that front, uh, the Western Front, um, after the armist- armistice with Russia. Allied troops struggled to hold another German offensive until promised reinforcements from the United States were able to arrive. So, like, uh, the United States' arrival in this thing was kind of the turning point of the war. Um, like I said, it was a stalemate for the longest time. Um, but once Germany get, got this armistice with uh, Russia, they they were able to focus more on the Western Front. Um, so, basically, Britain... And Fran- if Brit- if the British and Fran- French weren't able to hold out long enough for United States um, reinforcements to get there, who knows what the war would have been like, you know? Uh, the Germany and the Central Powers probably would have been able to conquer most of most, if not all, of Europe. Uh, well, no, most because I don't think they'd be able to. They wouldn't be able to conquer Russia, um, as we will learn about in World War Two. Um, but uh, they probably would have taken over most of Europe and probably gone over to Britain and Britain wouldn't have stood a chance against them. All of these powers combined, uh, obviously their navy would have put up a massive fight, but in the end, the numbers would have just been too overwhelming. Um, but... Um, this was it obviously it didn't happen and with the reinforcement of the united states on july 15th 1918 german troops launched what would be the last german offensive of the war attacking french forces joined by 85,000 american troops as well as some british expedi- as well as some of the british expeditory ex- expeditionary expeditionary force i think that's not how you say it um Expeditionary force, that's how you say it, in the Second Battle of the Marne, uh, which the Allies successfully pushed back the German offensive and lost, were finally able to launch their own counteroffensive just three days later. Um, after, one, once the United States arrived in Germany and they launched this counterattack, Germany was just unable to hold out against them. Uh, they had suffered way too many casualties to where Germany, they were, they were forced to call off um, any other uh, offensives. Like I said, um, they, they were forced to call off a planned offensive further north, where obviously they would have gone after like Switzerland, not Switzerland, <laughs> Sweden, Finland, all of them. Um... And this is where we really started seeing Germany, the flaw in Germany's plan to fight on two fronts. Because not only did you pick a fight with the strongest Western powers in the world at the time, Britain, France, and uh, the United States, but you also decided to pick a fight with the strongest power in the eastern front of Russia um, and sooner or later even even if you do manage to win on one of those fronts you, you, even if you do manage to win something on either of the fronts you're still going to be stretching yourself really thin with your with your military you know you're you only have so many people that will fight for you no matter how many allies you have, you only have so many people that will fight for you. <laughs> um, the Second Battle of the Marne, like I said, turned the tide of the war, war decisively towards the allies, uh, which they began to reclaim France, Belgium, um, for the rest of the war. Uh, this was... this. The, n- now we're at the armistice. Um... By the fall of 18, 1918, the Central Powers were unraveling on all fronts. Despite the Turkish vis- victory at Capoli, later defeats by invading forces and an Arab revolt had combined to destroy the Ottoman economy and devastate its land. And the Turks signed a treaty with the Allies in late October 1918. Um, 
Austria Hungary ended up dissolve dis- becoming dissolved becoming dis- dissolving um due to its grow due to the growth of the nationalist movements in its diverse population um which then they reached an armistice November 4th uh facing dwindling resources on the battlefield and the discontent on the home front and the surrender of its allies Germany was finally forced to seek an armistice on November 11th, 1918, therefore ending World War I. Um, this leads us to, after the war, you had the Treaty of Versailles at the Paris Peace Conference in 1919, where Allied leaders would state their desire to build a post-war world that would safeguard itself against future conflicts such, on such a dev- devastating scale. Um, the, the, some of the people that signed to this treaty were hoping that World War One was the war to end all wars. Um, but as we all know, the Treaty of Versailles that was signed on June 18th, 1919 would not achieve the goal. Um, saddled with the war guilt, heavy reparations and denied entrance to the League of Nations, which failed uh we'll get into that in a different video germany felt tricked into the signing of the treaty having believed many having believed any peace would be a peace without victory as put forward by wilson in his famous 14 point speech of january 1918 as the years passed hatred of the versailles treaty and its authors settled into a smoldering resentment of germany that would that would two decades later be counted among the casualties of World War II. Now, this led, this left a massive impression on world history. Not a proud, not a proud impression of world history, but an impression on world history. Um. This war took the lives of more than 9 million soldiers. 21 more, 21 million more were wounded. Um, the two nations that were mostly affected by this were, of course, Germany and France. Um, each of them sent about 80% of their male population between the ages of 15 and 49 into battle. Um, which obviously means that there needed to be a heavy repopulation of the male population for both of those countries. Um, this, this, uh, the political disruption surrounding World War I also contributed to the fall of the four vulnerable imperial dynasties, Germany, Austria, Hungary, Russia, and Turkey. Um, and... It brought about massive upheaval of as millions of women entered the workforce to support men who went to war and to replace those who never came back. Um, the first global war, this first global war also helped spread one of the world's deadliest diseases and global pandemics, the Spanish flu, which killed 20 to 50 million people. So, I mean, this, even after the war was over, it still was causing mass amounts of death. Um, this was, it was known as the first modern war because of the high technologies that were, that were used in it. Um, this was one of the starts of the use of chemical weapons, such as mustard gas. Uh, this the world war. It was just a terrible thing. World war one. Um, now I got all this information off history.com link in the description below to the actual, article i suggest you check it out if you want to read it for yourself um i put this i I basically took this entire article and um put it and i put it into my own words uh i quoted a bunch of it uh as well but not without the bits i did quote i didn't quote without putting uh my own two cents in or whatnot so uh don't flag me for copyright or some shit um, I also linked them in the description, like I said, so you can't, you can't get me for copyright, bitch. But, um, obviously, 
in my opinion, World War One was a terrible thing. World War Two was a terrible thing. Well, every any war is a terrible thing. Um, World War One should have never happened. Um, but it it like most wars, it's because of politics that this happened. Uh, we see we've seen it time and time again, where like German, you had. Uh, that's just started from the uh, start from one of the most well-known wars in history, the American Revolutionary War, where you had the British Empire want to take control of the thirteen colonies, and thirteen colonies weren't having it, so they fought back because um, they wanted to be a free nation. Then you see you've seen it in Vietnam, where you had the communist North Korea fighting against the uh, fighting against South Korea, who didn't want to be communist, I guess. Um, World War One, obviously, you had uh, a so you had a socialist nationalist movement um, member assassinate a world leader. Um, you had uh, World War Two. You had the Nazi. You had the Nazis and uh, the Japanese and the Italians who thought their uh, socialism was the best thing for the world uh they thought it made them superior they thought they were superior to any other race so that um that that ha that started world war ii uh even today you know with uh the uh, when you had the iraq war going on um i'm not even sure if it's still going on to be honest but uh we went into iraq to take out uh terrible regime uh that was killing off its own people and doing terrible things uh we wanted to end that po those politics uh and put in our own politics basically you've seen it with the korean war uh where you had the communist north korea want to take out the um what were the democratic or something i think they were democratic south korea uh that that happens so every any any war that's ever been was due to politics or either, either politics or religion um so i mean it's not a good thing it's not it really isn't um and personally i hate war um i think everybody hates going to war um but I mean, I'm all for going to war if the country deserves it. Um, I don't think we should go into certain conflicts that we have no part of being in, uh, like the Vietnamese War. Um, we didn't have any part of going into World War One at the beginning. Obviously, they gave us awards, a reason to go into the war, but uh, we didn't have any reason to go into the war in the beginning, and we didn't. So, um, yeah, World War One was just a terrible thing. Um, I can't erase history. Nobody can. Um, it's just one of those things that we got to live with, you know? Uh, yeah, it's in our past, but we can't forget about it or else we're bound to make the same mistakes. Um, so yeah, that'll conclude this episode of History Time where we went over World War One in depth and detail like i said link in the description below to the source that i got all this information from uh so yeah uh like i said like i was saying thank you guys so much for watching my name is as always cool mama jamma and i'll see you guys later stay cool jammas see you